This is Rabbi Neet Leah Sarna and Rabbi David Wolkenfeld. Shalom and welcome to the Straw Hat. We are the official podcast of Anshe Shalom B'nai Israel Congregation, an Orthodox synagogue in the beautiful Lakeview neighborhood of Chicago, Illinois. This is our The Chagim Are Over Now What episode. So first we'll be talking about all the cool stuff coming up in the Shul now that the Chagim are over. Um, and then we will turn our attention to Parashat Brishi, um, and with particular focus on the curses of Adam and Eve. And lastly, we will be interviewing my husband, Ethan Schwartz. Thanks for tuning in. So the Chagim are just behind us when our listeners are listening to us, at least. <laughs> <laughs> As we're recording, the Chagim are not yet behind us, but I, I guess the light is at the end of the tunnel or the something that the tunnel is closing. I don't know that. The, the end is in sight. They will, I believe that they will be behind us one day as the podcast is dropped. Yes. And uh, and so the question is kind of what happens now? You know, we've had this these kind of intense days where the whole community comes together and it's so nice. And then it's sort of like, okay, back to regular life for people who aren't Jewish professionals. This is very exciting, I'm sure. I think it's exciting for, for everyone, for Jewish professionals too, because we get to now like, take that inspiration and that um, experience of the holidays, that investment in our community, that investment in our own connection to the Torah and to mitzvot. And now we get to deploy it uh, in our, in our real life. It's where the rubber meets the road. This is what it's all Mm -hmm. about. And I think that's really great. I I feel really, really fortunate that our shul is one where even as our numbers expand, of course, for the holidays, there aren't too many like, you know, it's not like, um, an entirely different congregation on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. The vast majority of people in our shul on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur are people who come, if not every day or every week, they come every month or so. And, and it's, uh, you know, I know most of the people in the room somewhat well, you know, even mm-hmm. on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Uh, and it's wonderful, of course, that we uh, have people who come a few times a year and that we can accommodate them and, and, and provide a, a service for them too. But um, they're not the majority. They don't set the tone. I think that's really nice that um, it's like a shul for its for a community and a community that has a shul and the two are linked in that way and that means that we get to then continue to spend time together after the holidays <laughs> are over uh, and we have a lot of really great uh, ways to do that and I you know really sort of thrilled about the like the calendar events we have for kids for parents for adults and and everyone and and it's uh, I think a really nice uh, season ahead of us at the shul yeah so let's just talk about um, some of the stuff that's coming up so you know some of our yearly programs are kicking back up we have parent child learning starting back up again that's for kids in grades two through five, come with parents. When you come to enough of them, you get uh, a free uh, scoop of ice cream at Windy City. You get a cone also, or a cup, I should clarify. Oh, that's right. There, I feel last last year there was some uh, deep, was some deep confusion. confusion. Do I have to carry the ice cream in my hands? <laughs> yes. Do I have to pay for the cup myself? No. Uh, we'll pay for that too. I don't know. Maybe it's a Boston thing. <laughs> Anyways, um, but that's super nice. So for people who have kids who are just coming into second grade now or um, who, for whatever reason, haven't kind of taken advantage of this opportunity in the past. We come together either on Shabbat afternoon or Motzei Shabbat, um, and it's a time for parents and kids to learn together. And we have time. We provide sources, and parents learn with their children, and then we come back together and have discussion all together about these sources. Um, it's yeah. really great. I guess I, you know, I've participated as a parent and also as a teacher, and and both uh, usually. And and it's it's a really really. I, I think really enriching program. It's wonderful for parents and children to have conversations with each other about Torah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, as an educator, it's great to have a room full of adults and children. We can talk about Torah ideas together. And just, I just, you know, every um, extra, you know, thirty minutes, you know, whatever it is, ten minutes uh, in the course of your week, in the course of your month, that that uh, children can spend uh, learning Torah and being exposed to Torah sources, I think redounds to their future literacy and fluency and connection to the Torah as as adults. So it's really, I think, a, an important program and a really enjoyable program. And absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of those, um, even ten minutes. So we're also last year we kind of tried a couple of times to do parent child learning junior edition um, for kids who aren't yet fluent readers. And um, we're going to be opening that up again this year with more regularity. It'll meet just during Kiddush, kind of a quick 10-15 minutes. I think what we learned last year is that the more um, we can incorporate kind of pictures into our source sheets and and concrete things that the kids can then opine about um, without their parents needing to always be the like interpreters and readers, the more successful that is. So that's what we'll be aiming to do this year. Um, and again, that's parents and kids together. Um, and uh, we're learning and, and 
and then learning Torah together, and, and we're learning how to do that well, because neither of us are trained as kind of early childhood educators, but um, but there was a request for it, and, and we think the two times we did it, it was mostly really nice. So. Yeah, so we're going to try a whole bunch more, so yeah. uh, really different things for different folks, but we're... Yeah, excited about that. And then we have some stuff also for teens that's kicking off, just for those of you who haven't heard yet, where you're, um, a- along with our other Lakeview partner synagogues, we opened a teen Torah study program this year called Tikkun Chicago. Um, I'll be teaching one of those classes, actually, an introduction to the Jewish library um, starting in November. Um, so that's exciting. That's actually going to be meeting at Anche Shalom on Wednesday nights, kind of at the same time as Baby Josh Wednesday. So you might see us here. Um, there'll be a dinner. And um, anyways, if you have if you are a teen listener to this podcast or you are a parent of a teen or a friend of a teen definitely um, encourage them towards Tikkun Chicago it's particularly geared towards kids who aren't currently in day school but day school kids definitely you know could learn more to her also <laughs> um, so yeah so we're excited about that too and then there's adults obviously yeah, so we have um, Beit Midrash Wednesday is is returning. Uh, that's our, our evening of, of scheduled classes. Uh, the opening series of classes is going to focus on Chicago rabbis. Uh, I think, I guess, since the very beginning, we've done sessions on, like, who are the people, you know, who is Rashi, who is Ramban, who is uh, the Nitziv, who was Nechama Leibovitz, and, and just learning about the personalities and trying to appreciate their scholarship in the context of of their lives and who they were and what they wrote and what they taught. Uh, and so this is going to be a series focusing on people who taught Torah in Chicago and, and shaped uh, our community. So the first uh, uh, week is going to focus on Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik, mm-hmm. uh, who, you know, the... Uh, Chicago Soloveitchik. Um, Spelled differently, <laughs> so, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, he, his, his brother, what, I know, from the East Coast, I know that his brother, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik uh, of Boston and New York, uh, uh, with the T in his name, uh, it, was, it was more famous, but uh, Ron Soloveitchik was an incredibly important uh, and influential teacher of Torah, not only in Chicago, but internationally as well. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course, um, one of the great teachers of Rabbi Lupayan, who was you know, correct, a real correct. force in absolutely, creating absolutely. the shul as it is today. And who spoke about Rivaran a lot, and, and I think a lot of the Shul Min Hagim actually... Uh, Com- were influenced we're, by we're, we're, yeah, his guidance. Com- yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's actually not you speaking about him, right? We're bringing in a we're bringing in an outside uh, expert student <laughs> of uh, of uh, Rabbi Salvage. podcast listener. <laughs> yes, podcast listener uh, Milton Wachschlag and uh, parents and grandparents of sh- beloved show members, obviously. And, and and most relevantly, a student of Aaron Salvage. So right. someone who knew him personally and studied with him is going to be uh, teaching that session. I'm really excited about that. Uh, he's uh, spoken about him before uh, in the community and. So I'm really excited that we can bring him to, to Anshe Shalom. Uh, and then the other rabbis we're going to focus on are Rabbi Browdy, who was a, a rabbi of Anshe Shalom, uh, one of the, maybe the first really prominent rabbi to lead Anshe Shalom. We went to the south side, um, Anshe Shalom, uh, uh, Marian Pole Cemetery. Um, and what I learned there is that Rabbi Browdy's wife, at least on her tombstone, went by Rabbi Neet. So <laughs> I'm not the first. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. <laughs> so, so we'll learn a little about him and and some of his some of his writings. And uh, the uh, final class in the series will be on uh, Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz, uh, who was a really important philosopher of modern orthodoxy, and and was here in Chicago and taught here in Chicago, and was had a big influence. Again, not not just in Chicago, but really internationally as well. And so we'll mm-hmm. uh, look at some of his writings, some of his ideas. And he was at um, HTC, which helps us transition to our scholars and residents <laughs> good. coming up. Um, so we have in November 22nd, 23rd, we have a student of my father's, actually, Rabbi Dr. Zev Elif, um, who's just a wonderful human and speaker and scholar of American orthodoxy um, in all different kind of iterations of American orthodoxy. He put out this fabulous, if you don't have it at home, I I really recommend a reader, a modern orthodoxy reader. Um, It's like a textbook of the history of modern orthodoxy. But it's not really a textbook. It's like a collection collection of of sources, primary sources. sources, Primary sources, Right, right, right. So you would use it as, I guess, if you wanted to study or learn more about the history of modern orthodoxy and its broader American context, it's a tremendous, you you could just sit down and read through these primary sources. It's newspaper articles. It's you know, and... letters to the editor. It's like docu- you know, advertisements from Jewish newspapers and, and short essays. You know, really get a sense of some of the like controversies and challenges and, and major figures in, in that shaped our way we practice Judaism uh, going back uh, over, over generations. It's really a tremendously uh, impressive work. And I don't quite under 
Stan, you know, he's he's um, a young scholar. He's, he's younger than I am, and he's published, I think, six books already, and like dozens. And some of them he published also before he even did his doctorate. Right? I mean, he had published under, books. Like, I had a college undergrad, yeah, it's, and, it's, and as a Smicha student, yeah. yeah, it's a very. I, I don't quite. He's under- unbelievably accomplished, and yeah. I'm so excited to bring him here. And when he was in Boston and, and, and studying with my father, we he would like be around a lot. So we, uh, you know, we hung out with, with uh, we call them Zev, but <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Doctor Elif, um, um, really a lot, and he's a treasure of the show. Chicago community, and we're so excited to be able to bring him here. Um, and then after that, we really have almost every month we have someone coming in. We have another Chicago local, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Danishevsky, coming in December 13th and 14th. He's spoken at the show before. He, we brought him for a uh, series of Beit Midrash Wednesdays, I think two or three years ago, and it was really like his shirim were, were like really different and really spoke to people and uh, brought people out to learn from him who. Uh, really didn't come to other shirim. They really, he's personal relationship with God and spirituality, and in a very um, way that's both like spiritually deep, but also like really intellectually rigorous. And that's mm-hmm. a really like a special combination. And uh, he was really well received. I think follow, the aftermath of those shirim, he was like actually grabbed to give an Eli talk. I think that was like yeah. a, was, like demo tape or something. To so he's like you know uh, uh, online you know uh, teaching to thousands and uh, he then came back with Neely and spoke in our community so we're really excited we can have him for for Shabbat it's a, he has a really unique voice a special voice and uh, I think it'll you know bring a lot to the community and then we have we're mixing it up a little bit we're bringing in um, Michelle Greenberg Cobrin who is being sent to us by ORA uh, which is the organization for the resolution of Aguno she is a professor at um, of law at Cordozo Law School, and I think she used to be at Columbia. Also. She was dean of students at Columbia, at Columbia yeah. Law School, yeah. And uh, but she's also a Torah scholar in her own right, um, and so she'll be talking about um, Igun for the most part, and and the Aguna crisis in Orthodoxy. And actually, we're hoping that that Saturday night, January eighteenth, will for anyone who for whatever reason did not sign a prenup before they got halachically married, um, they should sign. We're going to have a postnup party, and there'll be an opportunity to fix that, even if your marriage is so strong and so wonderful. Wonderful. We're hoping you'll come out just to make a statement about this is this is the solution that that we're, we currently have to this problem, and you want to be part of that solution. Yeah, yeah. I don't. It's not, I don't think we're, you know people who are in loving, stable marriages. I'm not sure that they're at risk of, of this uh, of this problem. But I think it's a wonderful effort. Like it's a wonderful way to raise awareness, to really hammer in and reinforce and make sure it's crystal clear that in our community nobody gets married without a halakhic prenup, and mm-hmm. that's just a. Like, like it's a, a core a value and, and practice of our community that we're rigid about and strict about. And, and what better way to emphasize that is that people who've been married for decades before this uh, document even existed are going to come together in public and, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's kind of romantic, you know, like yeah. a free, reaffirm their vows and show that uh, even after all these years, they still have so much love for each other that they're going to sign a document to prevent themselves from causing tremendous uh, harm to one another and pain to one another and, you know, no, no matter what comes in the future. Yeah, and, and what I always say to, to my friends or, or couples who, who are planning to get married is this document is not about we're for sure going to get divorced someday, so let's make sure it goes well. It's I love you and I want to make sure that whatever human I become in the future, which I don't know what that's going to be, you're protected no matter what. Um, and, and obviously, like, we all continue to change throughout our lives. So at I, no I, point does this become <laughs> irrelevant. The, the line that I say at, at, at weddings is, uh, the halakhi prenuptial agreement of this form of it is very much like uh, vaccination. Mm. It is extremely, <laughs> extremely effective at preventing suffering, but only if it is uh, signed long before it's ever needed, and also mm. only if it's like routinely signed at every single wedding, so that in those rare instances where it might be necessary, it's already signed as a matter of course. And right. uh, I just made a joke about herd immunity, but it's actually wrong. Meaning, if you're the one person who didn't vaccinate, so in a herd, you're probably okay. If you're the one person who didn't sign a halachic prenup, that puts you at risk. Right? You're at risk, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it's not going to save you that your friends all signed halachic prenups. Well, herd, Im- herd immunity in the sense that it becomes universal. It's not if it's just a routine matter of course that right. every wedding has this. Then it's not like a fraught decision. Should I sign? Should I not? Am I at risk? Am I not? Why does exactly. you know? Why is everyone saying I have to sign this? Like, what do they think about my you know partner? Right? No, no. It's just this is routine. It's done. That's the herd protection. Like it's mm-hmm. a routine part of every uh, Jewish uh, marriage, and so there's no like fraught decisions we made on any on the shoulders of any. Oh, we can talk about this in January. Yeah. Lot, lot. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll maybe do a whole episode <laughs> on Igun. We have a lot of thoughts about it. Um, the other exciting thing that's happening in January is that the new Daf Yomi cycle is starting, which is huge. That doesn't come along very often. Every seven and a half years, it's like the modern. 
French with the psycho or something <laughs> in Chutzlaret, obviously. Um, and uh, so, first of all, like you can join Daf Yomi at any time. Uh, right now, we're in the middle of Masachet Tamid, which, if you want to make like an eight Daf Siyum, <laughs> uh, Tamid is fabulous, full of wonderful, amazing things about the Beit Hamikdash, which obviously I love. Um, but um, you can also join for Nida coming up in just a few weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, November, right? We're starting Nida. October. I think. October. Oh, October. We're starting Nida. Sorry. Um, and um, so that's gonna and Nida is like a fairly long but very kind of interesting masachet with all sorts of practical and not practical and and you learn lots about uh, the Zoroastrian neighbors of mm-hmm. the Jews. You have one of my favorite Talmudic characters is this uh, Zoroastrian queen Ifra Hormiz who appears in Masachet Nida a few times and she sends her Nida questions to the rabbis and she tries to like fool them and then they send her back these like cryptic messages of like haha we understood you send us lice <laughs> like we know what that blood looks like here's a lice comb um, kind of, well, anyways is, is, uh, is full of wonderful things so you're of course always welcome uh, to join for that and the second, just the second Ida starts at the end of October, it takes us through the end of uh, 2019, and then in January, the beginning of January is the start of Masechet Brachot, and the cycle begins anew. So it's 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 just a wonderful, um, uh, like simple supportive framework to get some Talmud into your life. The way the Talmud, the Talmud sort of assumes you know the entire Talmud. So if you ever want to study any portion of Talmud in great depth and great seriousness, having like breadth of knowledge of having seen many different tractates and many different chapters will be useful. Really any, uh, I would say, like traditional Jewish scholarship assumes you know lots and lots of Talmud. So mm-hmm. that's sort of value in the kind of, you know, Daf Yomi is kind of quick. It's a little bit superficial. If, you know, to do an entire Daf in, you know, 20 to 40 minutes is, is a pretty fast, Crazy. you know, pace. But, but the value love- you is you, you get concepts, you understand ideas, and, and that's you know for when you are able to invest in a more serious, rigorous you know uh, study, really any uh, traditional Jewish legal or, or not even legal uh, mm-hmm. topic, you you have like the, the the writers will make the you know these allusions to texts and concepts and and, and totally and like studies. we were just studying, we just finished Masachet Meila, and Meila is a concept that comes up all over the place, but there were some basic rules about Meila that I didn't, or just like the language that's used mm-hmm. about Meila that I didn't know until we started studying it. So, for example, if you did it on purpose, you wouldn't exactly use the language of ma'al about Mm it because then you've done something, like, so horrible that it puts you, like... It's a different category. It it puts you Mm -hmm. out of the category, which I I wouldn't have thought. Like, I would have thought mila is misuse... So, mila means misuse of... Misappropriation. Misappropriation of temple temple property, which is, like, a crazy thing to do, right? Like, you're stealing from God. (laughs) Um, um, And and, and therefore, the punishments are, are, are quite, you know, severe. And um, and so, but I would have thought that you would use the language of mila about someone who did that on purpose, also because it's this like kind of technical activity of misappropriating temple property. And it turns out like I was wrong, and I would have known that if I hadn't studied mila. So then that that just basic kind of simple fact will come up again all over shas and in any kind of subject that you're talking about because mila comes up everywhere. Right, like in Masechet Brachot, which we'll learn in January, we yeah. are told that eating, right, enjoying anything from mm-hmm. this world, eating, drinking, without smelling something bracha. nice without saying a bracha first is mi'ila, right? Right, and so it turns out if you do it on purpose, <laughs> it's not even mi'ila, it's worse. I guess, maybe. All right, we can, we'll, we'll, we can study that in Brachot. We'll make yeah, that well, association. Uh, well, oh yeah, anyways. Um, okay, anything else exciting coming up? Just we have a, a fourth uh, scholar in residence who's already on our schedule, so we can just sort of mention him, Rabbi Levi mm-hmm. Cooper, who is a very beloved teacher at Pardes, and he's the uh, a community rabbi in the small town of Tzor Hadassah in the mm. Judean Hills, and uh, a, a really lovely, lovely man. I, I he was uh, Sarah's teacher, Rosh Kolel, uh, when she was in the Pardes Kolel in a long time ago, and uh, he's a you know, delightful person. And he's coming as part of our partnership with uh, the uh, Mizrahi uh, pr- program. They they support and subsidize uh, communities in North America, bringing Israeli. Torah teachers to come to American communities, and so we've participated for three years. Mm-hmm. The first year, actually, we got uh, Shai Sekunda, and he spoke actually about uh, the Zoroastrian uh, context of Hilchamina, actually, and, oh, uh, and other really interesting things, spoke about uh, Israeli cinema. Uh, cool. And then we had uh, Rabbi Blau in this, for, for this right. project, and this year, Levy Cooper, so that'll be really great. Uh, just a few other like learning things that are happening. Uh, the introduction to Jewish life and practice is starting anew. Uh, it's not a seven-year cycle. It's more like a year-and-a-half-ish cycle. Um, yeah, maybe say something more about who that class is geared towards. Sh- absolutely. So it, it's um, the people who tend to come tend to be people who are 
interested in converting to Judaism, but in fact, I think the people who could benefit from it is a much, much broader uh, segment of the congregation. It's just like, you know, I could share the, the curriculum, but we study basic concepts of how Judaism came to be, how the Torah came to be, uh, how our halachic system came to be, our way of life came to be. And then we go through keeping kosher, observing Shabbat, the holidays, yeah, just very uh, like big picture themes, but also like very tactless, nitty gritty, how it's done, how it shouldn't be done. And I, I think there are just based on the questions I receive from members of the community, uh, I think there are many dozens, if not hundreds of people who could benefit from the class. And, uh, and if you want to know whether the class is free or not, a lot of it is on our YouTube channel. Correct, correct. I've now gone through the curriculum, I think three times. Uh, and so there are three iterations of me teaching the class, mm-hmm. uh, all on the Shul's YouTube channel. And, and you're welcome to, uh, you can compare it year to year. You can watch a few <laughs> classes and see if it's good for you. See uh, if he's gotten better. Uh, yeah, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, and, 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 but I think if you can come in, you know, come live, I think it's just nice to be live. It's and you more, get to ask your questions. You can ask your questions in the moment. I think it's, it's more, it's makes it more inspiring for me to teach, knowing the people in the room as opposed right. to just uh, speaking to a camera. But uh, that's, that's starting again. We just finished the cycle. You can come anytime, drop in, drop out. If you come long enough, wherever you start, eventually you'll hear. No, make, I'll make my way yeah. through the entire uh, curriculum. But uh, I, in fact, I'm starting on October 28th with, like, what is the Torah? Where did it come from? And mm. how did it? How do we get to our uh, halakhic way of life? So, like, a survey of the Jewish uh, book bookshelf um, yeah. and the baby. Um, the uh, also we, we are launching or uh, sort of midway through launching the uh, uh, WhatsApp pocket bait midrash, which uh, I. I uh, I'm really excited about it. I just, because of the holidays, I've not yet um, recorded the first. But my the goal is people are in a WhatsApp group and once or maybe even several times a week, I'll record short divrei Torah that will be based on uh, easily shareable text. So usually probably something from the weekly Torah mm-hmm. portion. And that way, either with books or with online links, everyone who is listening can also actually follow along and learn the source uh, together with me as I teach. So I think I'll try to stick to content that is easily accessible, and so we'll uh, learn together something on the Parsha. And I think the advantage of using WhatsApp as a platform is that I can record it you know, in my pajamas at <laughs> 11 o'clock at night, if that happens to be a convenient time for me, and you can listen to it uh, whenever you want in your pajamas at 7 a.m. or whatever, or mm-hmm. 6 a.m. Or, or in the car or whatever, and it'll be short, but, but in a way that way we can sort of bridge together students and teachers you know, in, uh, mm-hmm. across, uh, across times. Um, yeah, and then there's some other um, just initiatives of of the revitalized education committee of our show, which um, you should definitely, if you know any members of the education committee chaired by Benjamin Cohen, um, you should ask them about it and definitely get involved also. But they're looking forward to the Global Day of Jewish Learning, which will be on Sunday, November 17th. Um, and there's me learning for kind of every age group um, available at the show. And this is a day it's run by uh, Rabbi Hi. Steinsaltz mm-hmm. and, um, and his kind of team um, and people across the world are all learning on this one um, every year they pick a different topic and um, and so we'll uh, it's called speaking volumes from ancient arguments to modern meetings from raising our voices to remaining silent explore how and why words matter that's the theme uh, this year and we'll have different classes taught by community members at all different you know some geared toward children some towards adults there'll be breakfast and it should be just a really nice morning of learning for the show and then the other um, they're also looking to partner with 929 um, which is a project that has you learning a um, five chapters a week of Tanakh. Um, actually, a number of members of our show, myself included, um, Ethan is coming up, and Yamin Cohen has written for them. Um, they have every day when they start a new chapter, or you read a new chapter, so they, they publish little like 500-word essays on that chapter. Um, and so members of our community have written those and contributed in the past. Um, and so they're looking to partner with them and kind of raise the profile of 929 um, in our community as well, which is obviously very exciting too. Okay, I think we should uh, move on from this, but there's even more exciting stuff happening in the community. So if you're like, shoot, the Chagim are over, now I'm not going to have any Torah to learn. You have so much Torah to learn, and we have so much to offer, and we're so excited for all that is coming up in the year. And this is what it's for, like the point of the Chagim and the inspiration and the reflection and hopefully like dedicating ourselves to... Um, priorities of Torah and Mitzvot can, the, it, that's, now that we've done that, let's, let's leverage that to mm-hmm. actually engage. And we're really trying to provide many different opportunities for people to do that through our community. Yeah. 
So this week's Porsche is Porsche Appreciate, and obviously there's a ton that we could talk about. Um, but I actually got a question from someone recently, who obviously I'm going to pick this up with them again very soon, but she was wondering about the curses of Adam and Eve um, that had been at the end of Chapter 3, after they've obviously um, eaten from the forbidden fruit. So we're going to talk a little bit about about that. Can you just elaborate? What was her question? What was this? Oh, her question was, she was interested in why bringing children into the world is so painful. Um, like, why is labor so hard? And, and no matter what, meaning even if you use all the drugs out there and whatever, let's say you like completely go under, you have a scheduled C-section, you don't feel anything from the beginning to the end, you still have to then recover from your C-section. You know, like, there's no such thing as a painless way to bring a child into the world like human beings we're not created with pelvises such that we can like give birth to children and then like scamper off into the forest um, or women we're not um and um and like why is that like why why did god like why was this like the the brilliant design of a kind of to um invent humans in this way and, and why does it hurt so much um and what's the point so the torah seems to say right uh el haisha amar harba arbe etz vonech ve Heronech beetsev til divanim velishech to shukatech vahu yimshol bach. This end in the um, Kaplan translation to the woman. He said, I will greatly increase your anguish and your pregnancy. It will be with anguish that you will give birth to children. Your passion will be to your husband and he will dominate you. So that that is a curse. And that seems to be giving a rationale or a reason or, or giving some sort of religious meaning to uh, this biological fact. It's a, a dark verse, a very, very kind of sobering uh, curse. I mean, the snake got it off pretty bad also. And, uh, and, so the, man ha- the, and the man has a curse too. Everyone, every, a, lot, a lot of cursing and then the expulsion. But powers. I would say that, that men have done a better job at overcoming <laughs> their curses than women have. Not to say that the doulas and midwives and OBGYNs in our community are not doing a great job. They, of course, are and their work is so valuable. Um, one important thing that we should note, we should note is that these are, in fact, curses. So it's not like a mitzvah to experience pain in childbirth, just that it's not a mitzvah for men to work the earth and suffer in the creation of food. Correct. Right. It, it, there's right. It's, you know, it's the sweat of your brow, you'll eat bread. So that doesn't mean that there's a, that there's no, you know, air conditioning is wrong or something, or mm-hmm. that you should, maybe you could only have air conditioning at home, but not at your place of work. Uh, right. That, I, <laughs> I, heard, I read a New York Times article about how, how people now in, in like planters, they like stream just seasons and seasons of Netflix. Cause while they're like, in the driver's seat. Oh my gosh. Because it's like so, you're just, you have to sit there. Like, so apparently, someone still has to sit there. It can't just be done by a robot. But, like, you don't really need to pay attention. And you're just in this, like, cab for air conditioned cab for hours and hours and hours. And people just, like, watch a lot of TV these days, apparently. Huh, huh. So, so farming is not no longer hard. And it's actually not, not a new thing. The, uh, if you see some of the Midrashim and Rashi quotes it, that just even a, Relatively short time later, mm. Noah uh, invents a plow, right? And all right. of a sudden, it's like really easy or relatively easy to bring forth food from the ground again. Yeah. And it seems that Noah uh, and his father kind of notices this and gives it that that's his name maybe has that connotation because he's able to undo a little bit of that curse of the earth. And all of a sudden, we have this tool that enables us to plant and to plow and uh so too, it's okay and it's good for whatever method is that you think is appropriate with your medical philosophy and your body, etc., to try to alleviate suffering in childbirth. That's that's not a um, uh, it's not a good thing. It's not a command. It's not an obligation. It's just a uh, just a curse. So which which we seem to try to to overcome. There, you know, I, there's like apocryphal stories about some Christian group that like didn't believe in epidurals. You know, epidurals, for, for, yeah. based on this, you know, some reading of this of this uh, verse. I also heard that's just like not necessarily. I don't know if there are any Christian uh, listeners we have, but I also heard that's not true at all. And <laughs> it's just a uh, you know, but but even if it is, okay, you know, Jews definitely don't believe definitely that. Definitely not, right? Correct. And and we, we use we, everything available to you if that's what you want. And as well, again, also the the element of this curse of of um, the the domination of the husband is not it's not a command that families have to be organized in that kind of hierarchical dominant way. Uh, that's that's a description of um, of reality that. You know, is certainly true in some places and at some times, 
uh, but that's all in the context of a curse that we uh, that we seem to be in all sorts of ways trying to overcome through air conditioning, through the plow, through epidurals, right? right. Uh, and through marriages that are much more equal and, and without that, that element of dominance. Yeah, there, there's this funny, uh, or f- wonderful uh, debate between Rashi and Ramban about that line. So Rashi says, <laughs> meaning you'll have sexual desire for your husband. <laughs> so Rashi says, um, women should not solicit sex from their husbands it should all be initiated by him and the Ramban says why are you saying that it's not true this is um, praiseworthy in a woman um, as it says in Erevin um, page 100 this is a this is a good a good trait in a woman that she she uh, solicits from her husband so so it's it's funny even on, on this verse which Rashi wants to and then Ramban goes on to, to read it in a in a different way because he still needs to kind of make sense of the verse if he's going to reject Rashi's reading. But even to say, you know, oh, does the Torah actually think that that women should not, uh, or that marriages should be unegalitarian in that way? And, and, and Ramban says, that's not even what the curse is, let mm-hmm, alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I um, have a vivid memory, you know, the first uh, vivid memory of, of studying this uh, parasha with uh, uh, Rabbi Dr. Moshe Sakhalev, who uh, mm. at least uh, when I was in high school taught a... Uh, Parshanut Shi'or following the Hashkami Minyan at Lincoln Square Synagogue. Mm-hmm. I think that was a class that actually started like years earlier by Rabbi Silver. I think that was his initial uh, uh, slot, like the post Hashkami Minyan uh, Parsha class. Then he class. made it big. <laughs> uh, then he went off and started Risha. Maybe yeah. I, I don't know which came first. But uh, when I was in high school and living on the West Side, uh, Rabbi Sakhalau uh, taught taught that class, and it was my first exposure, I think, to, to Parshanut, that, you know, mm-hmm. here's a verse and here's our what, you know, let's look at the ambiguity and let's unpack it and let's see what that conversation, the ongoing conversation of centuries has been exploring and delving into and making sense of those ambiguities in the Psukim. And I remember very clearly on, on this, this section at the end, after uh, the serpent is cursed and the woman is cursed and the man is cursed, the, the couple, our ancestors, are expelled from Gan Eden and the Torah says that God uh, placed... Uh, Kruvim, some sort of uh, guardian, guarding angels. Uh, some interesting Kruvim, like cherubs, we think of as being kind of cuddly and uh, babies. And babies. And, yeah. and, and these Kruvim. That's not what we're imagining in the no, ancient world. No. Ethan actually one time taught, like, co taught Ashur about the Kruvim because we have all of these, like, we have, like, Lamasu, and you can go to the British Museum and see, like, these Assyrian, like, mm. humongous, like, animal things. Um, and so uh, it's, we have a lot of, like, ancient artifacts that, that can shed some light on what we're supposed to think of when we say the word Kruvim. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right. Because the truth is, the Kruvim and the Mishkan also weren't like babies. They yeah, were definitely quite not. mature. And, and uh, these Kruvim are, are guarding Gan Eden, right? So not, not babies at all. <laughs> anyway, um, they had this um, Cherv HaMetapechet, a, a uh, revolving. revolving sword. So Rabbi Sakala pointed out that in biblical Hebrew or in ancient, like swords were only sharp on one side. And this is so true that there's even a special word in biblical Hebrew for a sword that is sharp on both sides. That's called a like a cherub pipiot. It's like a, a double right. edged sword. Double edged sword. Right? Yeah. It's like a different kind of sword. It's like sharp on both right. ends. That's like the like like a like the new like the special An technology. Yeah. yeah, it's they sharp on both sides, right? So but a normal cherub <laughs> is only sharp on one side. So a cherub mitapechet, this sword that revolves, is actually a sword which only has the sharp end. The business end is only facing out uh, <laughs> half the time. And mm. the other part of the time it's um it's not. And and so maybe Gun Aiden isn't quite as inaccessible as you know, we might think, and we say, uh, and we put the Torah back, we say, this is the tree of life, the Torah is the tree of life. We say, renew our days as of old, but it's a reference to Kedem, this, Eden, yeah. the place like in the east where, where the garden was, uh, and uh, maybe like through our connection to Torah, we're supposed to be like kind of restoring some of that Edenic life. That's maybe the point of the Torah. And so I think all of these, you know, schwitzing while you're working and, and, and that, 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 I mean, look, it's, I don't think the schwitzing is just a, uh, I don't think it's not the sweating part. It, it's the, it's, a it's sis- the, the Sisyphusian the sense of, of, of degrading 
uh, act-breaking work that that is so unproductive and and just all thistles and thorns are coming and right so mm-hmm. we have the plow and now it's like much easier and now mm-hmm. we have the combine which is even easier yeah. right and, and and we have epidurals and we have you know for those who want it and we have other ways of of healthier um, less damaging uh, pregnancies and we have marriages that are more equal where people are husbands and wives are empowered you know to to exercise leadership within their families and within their marriages and that's all um, about this chadeshim in kekedem, trying to uh, navigate that cherev mitapechet and and to restore ourselves to to Aiden. There's a pasuk in Yirmiyahu where the prophet talks about a a woman um, pursuing her 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 husband in the way that. Uh, it seems the Mufarshim say was was not typical, maybe isn't typical, uh, and that that's seen as a portend of this uh, messianic redemption. That gender roles also are going to be a little bit undermined as we approach Shemot Hamashiach. That that all of these like and that too is like an Edenic return. Yeah, exactly. Of towards equality. That there's maybe you know that the world we yeah the things we find around us that are maybe are ubiquitous or seem ubiquitous or seem to be very ancient and mm-hmm. you know that may all be true, but that doesn't mean that it's the way things have to be or the way things are supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe we can work against some of those. Dynamics. Dynamics, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, and and I think I think you know th- you, we could talk about this forever, and and there's not like a you know one final resolving answer, but um, I mean like we can say how did it get this way? Well, Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden, um, but but to say well why is it that that men no longer sweat in the fields, but women still experience pain in childbirth? And 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 I think it's just a challenge going forward to say, well, that was overcome to a large degree. And and there's a lot of work left to be done on like the other half of this. Of this I, 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 I don't want to, um, I, I also don't want to minimize the struggles that people have to in work and work. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I think most of like, I guess if you're listening to a podcast, you're, you know, this podcast, you're probably not like physically like hurting your, you're not probably aching, you know, like physically at the end of a workday, but but that is true for many, many millions of people, men and, and by women. The way, I would say like the doctors and nurses in our community who spend all day on their feet, you know, that's hard. That's physical labor. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. So, so, so even right, there are even. Many and pro- I was talking to someone yeah, yesterday yeah. who said, "Oh, I used to be this kind of worker, and I switched to a desk job because it was literally too physically hard." Yeah. So, so, um, so, so I think so. so even so, even so, you know, all around us are people who have like yeah. physical pain from their work, and. There are people who have that that sense of futility of I'm on this rat mm-hmm. race and the more I work like the I still can't get ahead I still can't you know feel that financial right. security I'm still you know the percentage of Americans who uh, studies show would not be able to pay a, a four hundred dollar um, like unexpected expense right right is I think you know it's like most Americans or thirty percent right. of Americans some large millions and millions of Americans in the richest country in the history of the earth mm-hmm. who have a four hundred dollar right so so I don't know that's I don't and so, the other piece of yeah. it is that we've attached a language of dignity to work, right? And there's something very Protestant about that, or Protestant work ethic, whatever, right? And um, uh, Marx also writes very compellingly about, about how the work you do becomes kind of, or it gives you dignity. Um, and, and, and I think, like, our culture is so, like, suffused with that. And, and it's worth questioning whether Judaism actually agrees. Um, right? There is, like, an, an, a, at least one version of an ideal lifestyle in Judaism that does not involve work mm. and involves just like just study all the time um, and even right so this is a debate that appears a few times in, in, in the Talmud and uh, most famously between Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai and Rabbi Shmuel. Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai says if, if the Jewish people are doing what they're supposed to be doing like other people do their work for them like the ideal is you're going to learn Torah all the time yeah. otherwise Torah mata hala, right this is my favorite set of mm-hmm. uh, Talmudic sources uh, otherwise what's going to happen to the Torah and Rabbi Shmuel says no my yeshiva is closed during the harvest season like go harvest your food make sure you're gonna have enough to eat and then come back but even within the opinion of Rabbi Shema like if there were a world where your students weren't needed at home um, would that be your ideal world or not? And that's kind of a, a live question in in how to understand Rabbi Shmuel's opinion. Like, is work some kind of ideal, or is it just this is our reality and we have to bend our Torah study schedule around it? Yes, and I think that's also orthogonal to this curse because the curse is not you have to work and that's undignified. Or I, I think the curse is about the futility. It's about the struggle. It's about the working mm-hmm. really hard. And a, you're in pain, and b, you're not getting ahead. I, right. I think because people... Adam also worked, right? He was put in the Gan Lov Dal yeah, yeah. So it's not that Adam, Adam and Eve were sitting around all day. The curse either. is non-productivity. It's the it's the Kotz Vidardar, right? It's all this like you, you, you know mm-hmm. that comes out of the ground, thorns, things you can't yeah. eat, things you can't eat, that hurt you, and you can't eat, and it's not what you right. And that it's really, and I think that sense. I think there are a lot of people who feel that way, and it's not about um, 
you know, like Marx would say, that's alienated labor. And I mm-hmm. think uh, there's a lot, there's uh, that book whose name I can't think of right now, but the author I can't think of right now, who's saying that now it's that's actually spread up now to even like fairly wealthy people are also have, experiencing that alienated mm-hmm. labor where mm-hmm. they're just working all the time. It's the, the meritocracy that, that never gives reward, that you're always precarious and then you never feel that you're like, that, that sense of security. Uh, uh, even people who are objectively and even uh, relatively quite wealthy uh, feel that. So I, 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 I don't know, I think there's a lot of... Uh, uh, these curses seem quite relevant, and I think we, there's oh, a lot right. of work uh, in all, all fields for men and women. Snakes, too, certainly. Uh, we can help uh, <laughs> yeah, overcome would, these you know, curses. Snakes, maybe less of your attention. But <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> they seem to be doing okay. Um, yeah, okay, great. We're here in Schlensky Studios with my husband, Ethan Schwartz. So great to have you here with us on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, so I wanted to have you here on the podcast, first of all, so that you would stop bothering me about when you're going to be on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, um, because so many people in the show say to me all the time, Ravani, who's your husband? And then point to some random man in show and say, is that your husband? To which the answer is always no. So Ethan, um, if someone wanted to like, I don't know, meet you, what would they have to do? Well, I think the one place that they could find me, which is relevant to why you wanted to talk to me in this context, is uh, uh, at the Torah, Laning in Shul, <laughs> uh, which is probably the uh, function I play the most frequently uh, in this space, um, often downstairs on Shabbos morning, but also in uh, other various locations and services. Yeah. Um, and why is it that you like Laning so much? So um, I'm a doctoral student in Hebrew Bible, and uh, laning is a great opportunity to um, engage with the text that I study and in a in a religiously uh, meaningful way, in a specifically religious context, and also to contribute to the shul community in a way that engages uh, those skills that come from being uh, a professional student of of this text. And it's definitely the set of shul skills that. Um, I sort of naturally develop the most in my day to day life from just reading Tanakh. So it's a it's it's a great way to contribute. One cool thing about your degree, which I just feel like is like a great party trick for you, is that um, you had to read through all of Tanakh and like parse every word. Um, and even on your comprehensive exams, right, they just gave you like hunks of translation uh, from random parts of Tanakh, and you kind of had to know what every single word in Tanakh means. When I first met Ethan, he had on his phone, he was like constantly doing flashcards, like all these different words in all these different languages. How many languages have you studied? Uh, Enough. Enough. Okay. (laughs) I'll stop showing off about you. (laughs) And, um, but right. So that's like a fun thing that then also contributes to being a really good leaner, which is that you just know the text very, very well. And you know how to read it very well because of your familiarity with biblical Hebrew grammar. That's the idea. (laughs) So um, in preparation for this interview, I actually gave Ethan some homework and I asked him to prepare a few places in Parshat Breshit where um, someone who even slightly misread the text of this week's Parsha could massively change the meaning of some very beloved kind of well-known stories. So take it away. Yeah. Um, so I I basically, my, my goal when you gave me this assignment was just to work through the Parsha until I got to three. So this is certainly not the total number of them in uh, Parshat Breshit. I'm sure there are many more, but... Um, uh, I, I got to I got to three, and I said, "Okay, this this is this is enough to illustrate." And there are three uh, different kinds of potential mistakes in certain ways. They all have to do with mispronouncing certain aspects of words, but the grammatical aspects behind them are different. So I think they illustrate a wide array of what can go wrong, uh, and a lot more can go wrong in in laning than uh, than I think people often realize. So the um, the Hebrew language, especially as it's preserved so meticulously in Tanakh, um, is an incredibly elegant, mechanically uh, just very well-designed language that works in a very certain way, but that means that the rules can be knocked out of whack quite easily, uh, and, and as I think we're going to see in these examples, which are very small. So uh, for those of you following along at home, uh, we are in Chapter 3 of Breshit, uh, which is um, after the account of creation of humanity in the Garden of Eden. And so now we um, 
get the story of where things go wrong and um, and the, the temptation of humanity and their eventual expulsion from paradise. And uh, we're actually going to pick up right in uh, the, the, sort of the, the moment of truth where uh, the Nachash, where the serpent uh, convinces Eve to uh, go ahead and take a bite dun, dun, dun. Of, the, of the forbidden fruit, the proverbial forbidden fruit. So we are in chapter three again, and, and we're going to start off in verse five. So I'm going to go ahead and read it in Hebrew uh, with the correct pronunciation, and then I will um, uh, walk through uh, the mistake. This one is a pretty, for those of you uh, who have done some work with Hebrew grammar or have hung out uh, with um, people who are really annoying about Hebrew grammar like me or uh, use um, tikkuns for laning that mark everything you know, what, what do they call it? A A see my name, Tikkun, yeah. Um, that, that, that mark every possible little thing. You're probably familiar. You will immediately recognize what's going on here. But what we're interested in is the meaning and, and, and sort of the, the semantic stakes of this mistake. Like what, what really is going wrong when you do this instead of just not following the rules? Why is it important that you correct? So the verse goes as follows. Um, the, the snake says, Ki odea Elohim ki biyom achochem mimenu v'nifkechu enechem. So the snake is uh, saying to Eve, the reason that God does not want you to eat from this, uh, from this tree is because he knows that when you eat from it, literally on the day of your eating from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be uh, either, you will be like Elohim. So you will be like uh, gods like God with a capital G, like divine beings, something like that. You will be in some sense uh, um, on equal playing field with God, in as much as you you are yode tov vara, which you know literal translation there would be knowing uh, good and evil, uh, which seems in, in context to be kind of an artistic way of expressing total knowledge, knowledge of everything, right? Mm-hmm. All the way from good to evil. Like mm-hmm. you, you, you will be om- omniscient, just like, just like the deity. Um, so, so basically, the, right, the snake is saying God, God is being protective of his special status, and that's the only reason you can't eat from this. Um, so if you look at the word um, acholchem, this is a, a classic example of the phonological phenomenon known as a kamatzkatan in Hebrew, which is basically uh, a short O sound uh, that is marked in the Masoretic text by uh, a kamatz, which is the same vowel marker that normally indicates a long A sound, a long A, right? Uh, and that's how we all learn to pronounce it. Right. So meaning... My name has a kamat in the middle of it, so normally you pronounce it lea. And if that were a kamat katan, yeah, but don't even say that out loud because that's just not how the rules work at <laughs> right, all. Right, but so. but just to give you a sense of like what what a kamat katan sounds like, then my name would be leo. Okay, yeah, that would never happen. <laughs> but um, so uh, right, so it's basically it's just a, it's just a it's it's a situation where the same symbol was used to mark two different sounds, uh, and there is a rule which oftentimes scares people because it sounds very like grammatical, uh, like uh, technical language. But actually, once you learn the workings of it is very easy that you can always tell that a kamatz is a kamatz katan, which means it's an O and not an A when it appears in a closed, unaccented syllable. Now, we are not that that's for another time. We are not going to, you know, talk about talk about what exactly that means. Although, again, I promise you, it's way less complicated than two years into our marriage. I have not mastered it. (laughs) It's way less complicated than uh, than people uh, make it out to be for those who have a desire to actually learn the rules, uh, not to Love not me, to, my na- see my not to name good. names or anything. <laughs> um, but uh, but all you need to know for this example is that this this kamatz in achol chem in that middle syllable there under the um, chaf that is a closed unaccented syllable. So that is a kamatz katan. That's a that's a short o sound achol chem. Okay. So um, there's this funny thing where lots of Jews increasingly seem to have at least heard of the phenomenon of the Kamatz Katan, but there's a sense that it's like, it doesn't really matter, right? And, and, you, and you know, oh, the laners, even good laners, right, sometimes say like, you know, uh, yeah, I've heard of that, but like, who, who, you know, who cares? It's not like, correct uh, Blah, 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 yeah. yeah. So many people would probably read that as achalchem, 
right? Uh, and if, if it were if it were a long a, then technically that shva would be a vocal shva, so it would be acha lechem. But that's another rule that nobody follows, much to my chagrin. So, uh, an average laner at many shoals would likely pronounce that word achalchem. That's the point. Ki biyom achalchem mimenu. Now that vowel change is actually, you know, it's not just an issue of being precise and an issue of wanting to get the words right and follow the grammar right. This is actually a situation where um, where kamatskatan really matters on the level of meaning. And I will say just from the get-go, and you can back me up on this, that I, when I'm a gabi, I try to be very reasonable about not overcorrecting and really trying to think about when it comes to vocalization mistakes like this, is it actually worth throwing the person off and stopping them? Um, does it affect the meaning? And I, and I very often don't correct kamatskatan mistakes uh, because there's just no plausible alternative thing that they could mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, so I, I really do, I, I do not take you know, joy in like correcting people. I don't like sit there ready to pounce. Like my ideal, like I love when the laning is good uh, and I can just sit there as a gabi and do nothing, right? So so I really try not to overcorrect on this particular uh, um, particular uh, issue. But this one, uh, it seems to me actually could affect the meaning for the following reason. So what's going on with this word, achochem, right? It's biyom on the day and then uh, achol, uh if you just separate that off from the suffix there, this is an infinitive that is basically describing the action of eating, right? So this, this what we mean by an infinitive is that this verb, it's not paired in a limited way with a, spe- a specific subject, right? It's just the action of eating, right? And then that takes this suffix that makes it chem, your plural action of eating, right? So he's saying on the day of your eating from it, which is just biblical Hebrew way of saying when you eat from it. Right, mm-hmm. and oftentimes in the Bible, um, you describe the time at which an action takes place by using this infinitive structure. Mm-hmm. Right now, if it were indeed, if, if someone were to say "achalchem," at least as I can uh, reconstruct it, that would be that would sound exactly like this were actually a finite verb "achal," meaning he ate, and then "chem" there would not be a suffix of belonging. Right? It wouldn't be a genitive suffix. I we, mean, he ate them, right? On the day that he ate you. You, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, plural, yeah. right. So, ki odea Elohim ki biyom achal chem mimenu. For, uh, for God knows uh, that on the day that he ate you from it, right? <laughs> so, now you might say that in, in total, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And therefore, what else could it be but... Um, you're eating. It's. It does seem to me that in terms of the word itself, achalchem could sound exactly like he ate you. This is a uh, um, a case in which, based on normal Hebrew pronunciation about how, because most Jews, uh, at least in you know more typical, less less kind of yeshivish Ashkenazi context today, don't really distinguish between a kamatz and a patach. Right? It's just an a sound. It's ah. Everything sounds like ah. So th- this would just sound like. A, a past tense, what, what in modern Hebrew you would call past tense verb, uh, and then a, and then the and then the direct object suffix of of he ate you. So all right. Uh, so you're turning God into somebody who eats eats people uh, in that case. So it's all switching from an o o to an a ah, potentially. All right. Maybe we'll take a look at some other ones. Yeah. So if you want to jump down just a couple verses to verse seven. This is after the deed has been done. So verse 7, Vatipakachna enei shnehem, v'yedeu ki erumim, sorry, ki erumim heim, v'yitperu ale te'ena v'yasulahem chagorot. Okay, so so they, basically what happens here is, uh, remember what the snake said, your eyes will be opened and you'll have all this knowledge and you'll be like Elohim. So basically this happens. Vatipakachna um, inei shnehem, both of their eyes is after Adam, right, has already eaten from the fruit. Uh, so both of their so eyes... Eve's eyes like waited to be opened until Adam had also eaten from the fruit. That That's your department, not mine. Okay. Uh, so uh, so uh, both of their 
their eyes are opened and they and they knew it's an inter- actually just an, an interesting kind of um, pun isn't the right word, but it picks up it picks up on the snake's uh, warning in an interesting way because indeed their eyes are open and va- va- de u, right and and they have knowledge, but the knowledge is not tovara, it's ki eru mim heim, right? So there's something interesting there. But anyway, so so what we're interested in the is the eyes. So you'll notice uh, in that first very first uh, uh, word in the verse again, um, this is uh, chapter three verse seven. Right, so you have a kamatz, and this is a real kamatz. This is a long ah sound um, under the pe in vati pakachna, right? And what that means is that this is from the the nifal binyan, which means that it is generally speaking the, the nifal, as in modern Hebrew, has a kind of passive or sometimes a reflexive meaning of what's normally an active verb, right? So like. Asa, to do, right? He did, nase, it was done, right? So um, so that's normally how, how this works. Uh, but that extra syllable in there that comes from the nifal, that vati pa kachna, sounds a lot less natural to a lot of, of people who know Hebrew because it's just a much rarer form than uh, the, the, what, what we would call in biblical grammar the kal or, or in modern Hebrew the pa'al form, which would be um, tifkachna, right? The pe becomes part of the first syllable with the tav, right? Okay, so what would it mean in the kal? So in the, well, think about the, think about the, uh, the blessing of God as, as uh, pokeach ivrim, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I checked on this before and I can't vouch for every instance of this verb in Tanakh, but normally pakach as a verb of opening eyes, seems to be transitive as opposed to intransitive, which means that it's something that you do to eyes. It's not mm-hmm. something that eyes do on their own, mm-hmm. right? So, so we so we have statements in Tanakh of God being pokeach enayim, right? Mm-hmm. God opens opens eyes. So, if this were tifkachna, then the enayim would be the subject of a transitive verb, the eyes would be doing the opening to something else, mm. right? So, vativkachna ene shnehem. Would mean like their eyes opened the can of tuna fish or whatever. Them, shnehem, opened oh, both opened of them. them. <laughs> right now, strictly speaking, you would need an et there. So once again, you could claim, okay, it could never mean that. But if it was vativkachna as opposed to vativakachna, then strictly speaking, the a naim would be the subject of a transitive verb. So in terms of incorporating this into how you, th- how you think about laning, if you're a laner out there listening to this, a- the place where I notice this mistake the most is in parts of the Torah that deal with the korbanot, where, uh, which because of the special readings for the holidays around this time of year, they're all over the place. Uh, I hear a lot of um, where the Torah says, Yeasa, let it be done. Right, a lot of yaase, um, let him do, mm-hmm. right, uh, and that causes real problems in terms of the grammatical relationship between the verb and because usually it's saying yaase, some sort of acti- right, let this ritual activity or let this uh, legal process or something be done, right? Uh, let this be done to the cow as opposed to let the cow do this. Yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. So um, quite so different. It might seem obvious when you're looking at it on a page like this, vati pakachna versus vati kachna, but when you're laning and you're fast and you're in, you know you're you're moving through it quickly, especially something that's very subtle like yaase versus yaase, that that's a very small difference. Um, but the the change on the level of meaning is quite significant. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last the last thing I'll point you to at, at the, um, so we sort of, we, we get a moment from each each part of the story. We have right before the transgression happens, immediately after, and then in the consequences, in God's statement, um, this this is a favorite of mine, and Leah has definitely heard uh, me talk about this mm-hmm. a lot, because um, so, it comes up in so many central texts um, that, that show up from Tanakh in the liturgy. Uh, so now we're going to jump to verse... 18 um vikots vidardar tatsmiach lach ve'achalta et esav hasada basically god is cursing humanity and saying the land is going to only bring forth thorn and thistle uh great kots vidardar it's a great great pair mm-hmm. um and you uh shall eat the the grass of the of the field right so the key issue here is is the accent on the verb ve'achalta right which if you think about that verb normally might sound a little odd because if you wanted to say in modern Hebrew in the past tense, you, masculine singular, ate, well, how would you say it? Achalta. 
right? Achalta, right? Yeah. With the accent on the middle so the syllable there, achalta, right? That right. sounds much more natural. Achalta sounds like someone who doesn't know Hebrew very well and thinks that everything is supposed to, every accent is supposed right. to be on the last syllable, right? Yeah. Um, but indeed, the trup in the Masoretic text marks the accent. And here indeed... But that's just a good thing, by the way, for our listeners to know, right? That the definitely. place in the word where the trup is... That's where the accent is. You don't have to know every single rule of biblical Hebrew grammar in order to know where in the word an accent should go. You just have to look with your eyes at any version of the Hebrew Bible that has Ta'ameh HaMikra. The answer is right in front of you. Right. And oftentimes it's not just that, oh, it's like a little trick. Oftentimes part of the function of certain accentuation is to mark grammatical issues. I mean, if you look, just a great example from the previous verse we were looking at, um, if you jump, what was it, seven, verse seven, va-ye-de-u, um, you'll, you'll notice there's a munach uh, on the first part of the, of, of the verb there, right? And the fact that there is an accent on that, that yud, even if you didn't know that it's seire uh, is a long vowel, the fact that there is an accent there uh, tells you the next uh, shva there is going to be uh, a shva, a shva na, because of of that long vowel in the, in the previous syllable, and the um, and 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 the trup tells you things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely good to keep uh, in mind that the the trup is there to help you, yeah. <laughs> not just with like tune or whatever, but also with pronunciation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So anyway, so let's go back to the example we were paying attention to before, uh, verse eighteen. So so ve'achalta. Right, so that sounds weird if you're used to speaking Hebrew, especially from a modern Hebrew context. But even in biblical Hebrew, the normal way that verb would be would be achalta. So what's going on there? Is this some sort of anomaly? Uh, well, no, actually, this is a particular uh, context in which this shift occurs, and um, it pains me to do this, but I'm basically going to use modern Hebrew terminology here because I know that that's what's familiar to most of you. Although, like, this is never how I would talk about this um, in uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of the the actual context of biblical Hebrew, but so. In modern Hebrew terminology, we, we would call um, a, a verb like a chalta, a past tense verb. What Ethan's bristling at is that in biblical Hebrew, there's no such thing as past tense. There's Yeah, there's strictly speaking, there's no tense uh, in biblical Hebrew. Uh, biblical Hebrew thinks of uh, verbs as having aspect instead of tense. We're not going to we're not going to get into that right now. But the but point is that what we call past and future tense in modern Hebrew that is a um, the Mishnah mis- already has uh, modern has past and future. It, yeah, it, yeah. Mishnah Hebrew is already well on its modern way. Modern Hebrew is based on yeah, Mishnaic correct, Hebrew. correct. Um, but I will, I will give you. Sorry, I'm going to go off script for a second, but just to, just <laughs> just, to, just to make this point, uh, the one, fortunately, one of the best examples of why you can't call these things past and future tense when it comes to Tanakh is actually in our parsha as well. If you go to uh, the beginning of the Garden of Eden creation story, so we're in Genesis chapter two. Um, verse six, the aid ya'ale min ha'aret, mm-hmm. right? So the verb ya'ale in modern Hebrew, Leah, you would translate how? Uh, will come up. Yeah, he will. will he will go up. He will yeah, rise. He will right. Rise, yeah. um, he will ascend, um, and that would be um, a future tense in modern Hebrew. So if we take that translation here, aid means like so, there's disputed understandings here. Some people think it means like a mist. Some people think it refers to a, sp- a specific kind of river. Whatever. We're just gonna we're just gonna call it the aid for uh, simplicity's sake with an olive and not with an eye and aid, not witness. Right, aid with an olive. So and the aid will go up from the land. Which makes no sense because we're talking about the primordial past. We're talking about the beginning of time here. What is this? And the aid will go up from the land, right? So in fact, what's going on here is that Yale is not a future tense in biblical Hebrew. It is an imperfect, which means that it marks incompleted or ongoing action. So this doesn't mean the aid will go up from the land. It means the aid was going up from the land. The aid was in a perpetual state of going up. It wasn't something that happened right in one moment. It, it, it doesn't say vayal ha'ed min ha'aretz, right? Or vayal aid min ha'aretz. It doesn't mean, and at one specific moment, the aid went up from the land. It means this was happening on a routine basis, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what we mean by it's imperfect, it's incomplete. The verb has not, the action has not been completed. It's something that's ongoing. So right there, in, in this Parsha, chapter 2, verse 6, very clear example about why this past future terminology does not work for biblical Hebrew. All right. But, back to Achaltah. Okay. Sorry. So I'm, so, uh, but, but we're going to use it in this case. So we have this past tense, but what's going on here is that the Vav at the beginning is basically converting 
what, again, in modern Hebrew, we would call a past tense into not exactly a future, but into sort of a, a statement of, um, of will, like, like God is saying, this is what's, this is what's going to happen, right? It, it's a it kind of, a uh, an expression of divine, uh, volition. So, um, so it means, uh, you will eat the asev of the Sadeh. You will eat the grass of the field. So what actually achieves that flip from, again, in modern terminology, the past to the future or the past to the expression of will, mm. it's not just the vav, but it's also this shift in accent, right? Mm. So the accent goes forward to the end of the verb, not ve'achalta, but ve'achalta. And without it, that needs to be read just as ve plus a quote-unquote past tense, right? And, and, and almost all Jews intuitively know this, actually, because um, in the Shema, it's not ve'ahavta, at Hashem Elokecha, right? It's Viahavta, right? Think about think about when you learned it in Hebrew school and you learned it with the trup, right? Mm-hmm. Viahavta, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's it, it's uh, it, the accent is right there on, on the on the last syllable, and that is correct, even though it normally sounds wrong. If you were to say Ahavta in a normal sentence, that would sound very weird and wrong, and it would be. Um, but in this case, it's actually right. So if so, if a laner, if I were gabbying, mm-hmm. and a laner were to say. At Asef Hasadeh, I would 100% correct that because that completely change, changes the meaning, right? It does, not, it does not mark it as this converted past. And I just, a quick story about this is that this, it's such a, it's such a like, real rule that I have this very vivid memory when I was doing my master's. Um, one of my professors, uh, um, a great biblicist, um, a, like a, a gadol in the field of biblical studies, was reading a, a pasuk out loud and he instinctively made this mistake and immediately corrected himself, and I've never seen someone so mortified. He was just, he was so ashamed of himself. He was Aww. like, oh my God, I can't believe I did this, right? Because, <laughs> because it, the, this is a serious, it's a serious grammatical rule. Um, uh, and I always think about that when, when, when I, I see this mistake made in laning and people have no idea in contrast to, you know, this professor who was like rending his garments over, <laughs> over, this, over this mistake. So, uh, so that's another important one to keep in mind. Um, and I just wanted to wrap up with, uh, you have some, some, uh, pet peeves that I think our listeners will find funny. Such as? <laughs> of what genre? So, so, for example, your favorite one from the Haggadah, from, from the Manishtana. Oh, yeah, right. So, so there are some places where certain grammatical rules have exceptions. And so one of them is that the number two, the first syllable of the word, the shin, gets sort of collapsed with the next syllable. So when, uh, you say... Shte fe'amim, it, it really needs to be shte with one syllable. Shte fe'amim, not shite fe'amim, but the, but the universal tune that everybody uses right, separates it. And by the way, that would be a correctable mistake if it were laning because shite sounds like the imperative or the tzivui, the command form of the, of the verb shata, to drink. So it sounds like you're saying... Drink twice. Drink twice, right? <laughs> Take two shots. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, uh, so, and Leah knows well that at our, at our Sadarim, while everyone else is saying shite, I'm very resolutely saying there stay um, <laughs> so uh so yeah so you can for those of you uh, who are teaching manishtana to your uh to your kids this this year you can you know start the grassroots revolution and teach them stay <laughs> and that, that is that is uh, grammatically correct and you will be saving them from grave grave error <laughs> grave error any other grave errors our listeners should uh avoid with their lives uh, that 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 you're right is, is always a is a is a favorite one of mine uh, i can't think of any others at the at the moment <laughs> but uh always available to uh tell people how they're mispronouncing uh uh the lush and Kodesh, so <laughs> um all right so now you've met my highly particular <laughs> Husband. And probably will be glad that you have never seen me in real life. <laughs> you can talk about other things too, um, like baseball and scotch. And um, I don't know, what else do you like talking about? Yeah, that about? pretty much covers it. <laughs> Tanakh, baseball and scotch. Chicago. Chicago, right, right, right. Um, yes, yes, right. People always get a kick out of knowing that you're from like this very neighborhood. Indeed. And your parents live in walking distance of our home and our show. And in fact, um, when I um, when we were dating and I would come like spend Shabbos with your parents, we would we would walk to Anshay Shalom long before there was a job available here. Um, Correct. So... 
So just like a nice little tie between your family and their proximity to our Shalin community. I feel like also people get a kick out of knowing like you went to Anchamathy school through eighth grade. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know. What else do people always love hearing about you? <laughs> what are your other crowd pleasing oh, tricks? <laughs> <laughs> Basically that I'm married to you. That's usually my that's usually, <laughs> that's my usually claim to fame, and that's about it. Like well, <laughs> that basically covers it. Oh, everyone always loves hearing like how did you meet? And um for that like not particularly interesting story, you can ask us in person. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Straw Hat. Thank you, as always, to our producer, Haley Lavendal, for all of the hard work that she puts into making this podcast happen and to making sure that Rabbi Wolkenfeld and I find the time to even put this together (laughs) because it's still the chagim for us while we're recording this. If you have positive feedback, please feel free. Find us in Shul. Tell us in person. Send us nice emails. We love it. And if you have negative feedback, you can feed it to a snake. Um, Snakes can be found at the Lincoln Park Zoo and also at the Shedd Aquarium. And if you're really unlucky, then maybe in your backyard. Have a wonderful week.